and theorists theorizing. We got another special interview episode today. I'm Braden. I'm Zell. I'm Dan. And I'm Andrew. And today we have the pleasure of speaking with Jason Martell. Some of you might recognize him from, uh, you know, the well-known series uh, Ancient Aliens, which is right up our alley. He's a, but he's also a well-known researcher, author in the fields of ancient civilizations, extraterrestrial life, and advanced technologies. It's just all over the place. Just absolutely jack of all trades. Um, I, I, I believe you have over twenty years now studying and investigating the, the vast amount of mysteries that that suffuse our world and also exploring the possibilities of extraterrestrial life either here on earth and now or in the past and also uh you've appeared again uh ancient aliens a number of other tv shows that uh, you've been in and you've also published several books i believe with knowledge apocalypse is one yes um and the uh, with a number of topics like covering just about all of the coolest stuff that have to do with the connections of either you know ancient ancient astronaut theory and uh, you know the connection with extraterrestrials, perhaps visiting Earth sometime in the past. I think I nailed it all. Just all around badass it. legend. Thanks for coming on the show. It's my pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for such an eloquent introduction, hitting all the points there. Uh, yeah, it's it's my pleasure to be on and have a fun conversation tonight with gentlemen. We didn't use AI to come up with any of that, by the way. No, that's <laughs> right. No. Well, we can we can make sure we throw that into the pot tonight as well and mix that up. <laughs> one of the ingredients. Awesome, Jason. So to get the get the conversation started, I mean, what led you down the path to delve into these ancient mysteries of mm. ancient civilizations and pretty much how did you get started down this field? Because it's not a it's not a common field. They don't teach it in high school. They don't. I appreciate the question. You know, it's interesting. I'm 49 now, and looking back, time flies. Uh, when I was in college in my early 20s, first of all, there was a different climate for those, for those, you know, these type of topics, ufology, paranormal, ancient astronaut theory. If you said ancient astronaut theory, someone would be like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... 20 years ago, these topics were not as prevalent as they were today. Um, <clears throat> a little bit harder to, to broach the conversation with my peers. So when I was in college as a, you know, just as a layman college student studying science and technology, waiting tables, surfing when I had time, living in San Diego, uh, someone had mentioned to me that, you know, there's this company that has actually imaged on the surface of Mars, pyramids and what looks like a huge human face, but they're just not talking about it publicly. And I was like, how could this be? What are you talking about? This sounds like it would be the greatest discovery. Um, and it turns out that, you know, in doing my homework, the company being referenced was called Malin Space Science Systems, which was also located in San Diego where I was attending college. Interesting thing is Malin Space Science Systems is in charge of basically arming all the orbiters and landers for the most part of the last 20 years for the, the um, <clears throat> satellites and landers we send to Mars. They're using a Malin Space Science System camera. And so all these shots of the face uh, from the Mars Global Surveyor and a few other missions, I just contacted Dr. Mike Malin as a college student and asked him, are these structures possibly artificial? And he said, no, they're all natural weather erosions created by, created by natural processes. No aliens or humans were involved. And that just kind of raised, <clears throat> made my, <clears throat> excuse me, that just made my, my eyebrows raise even more in curiosity. I was able to find several peer review scientists. One of them named Dr. Mark Carlotto, who mm -hmm. developed mathematical algorithms for satellite telemetry to detect artificial objects. Meaning if we're taking pictures of Russia, he could run his fractal analysis and say, oh look, those are tanks and troops covered by tarps or shrubbery. So his fractal analysis could identify artificiality. We ran his fractal analysis over the Cytonia region with the face and pyramids. You get a 98% hit that these are artificial structures. So NASA just never went to any great lengths to verify any of the data that's in their archives about the face or the pyramids. 
Um, and, and so I think that's, and I can go into more detail, but that's what really sparked my curiosity and going, well, wait a minute. These are structures on another planet that we can't even figure out, let alone the ones all over our own planet that lead us back into our true origins. And so I think that's what really start, you know, started to spark my curiosity. Now, do you think possibly that they have done that research and are just hiding it? Most definitely. The, the, the answer I just presented at this year's Alien Con was that there's a track record of obfuscation around the real data publicly um, and in, you know, and in without their, without their meaning to do it. Meaning we, we've had a track record of NASA since they started releasing photographs of the moon, like smudging stuff out, copying and pasting it, doing bad Photoshop edits before we had Photoshop. We can run AI analysis now on that old, old data set and say, wow, look at all these human made <laughs> uh, you know, changes and, and identify them very easily. And some of them are like, mm, you're covering stuff up. So it, there's so always you, been a What you're saying is you're saying is NASA is really the first catfish. In a sense, they're definitely they're making catfish. it. <laughs> yeah. Or even, yeah, I would say they're making it look like there's nothing there at all to look at. It's like a reverse catfish. Yeah. What, they're, what they're doing is basically obfuscating the fish data. Cat. Yes, it's a fish cat. And so now that... <laughs> All the latest imagery of the face, you know, they've imaged it over the last 20 years repetitively, and each time it's just getting worse. So it's it's basically the same track record that they're doing with ufology in general is obfuscation of the real data and saying, you know, we're going to give you some answers, we're going to look into it, and no, they never do. So that's that's the current status of that. Never a straight answer, as they call them. That's right. NASA, never a straight answer. But we're hoping to send missions like SpaceX and others that are publicly funded for the most part. And with more direct access, people foot to Mars, you know, we're going to get some real answers, I think, within our lifetime, which will be interesting. Oh, that's super cool. We can't wait. So just like, do you think so if we if we went to Mars and we, and we find these artificial uh, structures like say a pyramid structure would you instantly link that this is obviously maybe some sort of civilization that has come through made these structures on mars made these same structures on earth like is there at that point would you say a direct connection between the two planets i'd, I'd say there's a there's definitely a mars earth connection at the root of the question <clears throat> but there's a deeper solution to figuring out the problem when i started to look at all the other ancient cultures um, here on earth, I really started focusing in on ancient Iraq, which is known as Sumer, Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. Babylon. Babylon. Yeah. Um, and the interesting connection there is seeing that across those cultures, oh, I'm sorry, I've got some children in the background. Hey, I apologize. Right, we, got we, 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 got we got them too. We got them too. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's um, fine. They're Ours are just tied up upstairs. So yeah, we lock them up. Yeah. We lock them outside. Yeah, they'll, they'll settle down. <laughs> there, there's pyramids of knowledge across cultures um, that we can't explain how they have this knowledge, and it leads to a bigger question to say all the ancient cultures, the top thirty that we know of across the world, were all influenced by some lost technological civilization that was here before the Great Flood. We don't know exactly who they were. But unraveling them and understanding their place in our chain of events in the historical record that's lost right now off our history books, they're most likely the best candidates. Um, we can refer to them in ancient aliens terms as the Anunnaki or, you know, the Nephilim or, you know, these giants that once walked upon the earth. There's different labels. We really don't know, but there's a strong connection to show that some lost great race that was technologically advanced, influencing all cultures, probably was doing stuff on other parts of the solar system uh, in companion to Earth's presence as well. See, that, that makes a ton of sense to me because, like, you look at the Babylonians who had the star catalogs and the Sumerians who were responsible for, what, like hundreds of firsts in technology. And they have this advanced understanding of astronomy and math and and it's like, what exactly was it about that area, right? Like, was the Euphrates and the Tigris spiked with Adderall? Or, like, where are they <laughs> getting all this fucking information from, right? You know, what's also interesting is the further back you go, 
You look at the times of the records of, even when it hits the New King James Version in English, and no, the story of Noah, look at the lifespan of Noah. It's over 900 years. When you go back further into the Sumerian and Akkadian versions, the Sumerian kings list shows the lifespan of some of these kings in their ruling times of being thousands of years. <clears throat> you have to wonder if this isn't mythology, and I'll give you another example. We don't understand currently what heaven means or all those things in our mythology, but one of those in the Sumerian you know, uh, lexicon of information is Nibiru is another planet where these gods, the Anunnaki, supposedly come from. And this planet is on a 3,600-year orbit around the sun. So <clears throat> if you figure one solar year for us is 365 days, that's how long it takes for our planet to go around the sun, 365 days. One solar orbit on Nibiru is 3,600 of our years. Hypothetically, let's say Jesus Christ was an Anunnaki, or came from Nibiru. Now, I'm speaking hypothetically. I don't know that. But looking at the timelines, he's here. He leaves. And 3,600 years pass on Earth. While he's been on Nibiru, it's been one year for him. Just one year. He comes back on Earth. It's been 3,600 years. The whole idea of just going to another planet and having a longevity of lifespan or working between the two planets, there's just a whole other you know, uh, wealth of information if we can dive deeper as we learn more about these ancient gods and the extraction of information that man at the time was taking from them. We're now starting to decode a lot of this lost science and knowledge, and, 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 our, and, and we're still trying to catch up, basically, is the answer. It, right, I always we, find that the most fascinating thing that, you know, with pe people who are staunch believers in religion will will almost scoff and gasp at the, <laughs> at the you know, a, like a, be like, maybe he was an alien. Maybe that's how he did all these amazing feats that no one else has ever done. And they're like, N what? I, like, absurd. And you're like, well, no one else has turned the water to wine, part in the seas. Like, you know, no one, no one else is doing these feats. So it's like, why, why is it so hard for, you know, that, um, t to b make that connection for people who believe in Jesus that, well, you know, perhaps he, he wasn't from here. Given the time of year, right? Easter's coming. Obviously Jesus, Anunnaki came to earth to hide the eggs. <laughs> makes perfect sense. <laughs> no, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, he, he wasn't from this world. I mean, that's, that's right. A, he's not from that's here. That's basically what the story tells us, right? <laughs> this is not from here. He was sent down for whatever reason. It was to cleanse sins. I mean, stuff is lost in translation over different versions of, of biblical text. But in essence, he wasn't from here. He was an alien. I talk to the people knocking my door all the time. I tell them the same thing. And they go, <laughs> what? And I go, he wasn't from here. He was an alien. And then they leave and come Sal back. Sal pulls home. a reverse Uno card on them when they, when they <laughs> knock on his door. When you mention the word like Jesus, right, it's a very esoteric conversation. And I would say that, you know, being open-minded to the topic, one, is a prerequisite. It's not meant to say anything one side or the other. To, to balance the conversation, I would throw out there's a great movie that people should watch called Zeitgeist. Yeah. Zeitgeist gives you a whole new perspective on the whole role of a Jesus character being played out by many other figures throughout time and having the same set of events at the birth of the time of the three stars aligning and everything, uh, almost to show that Jesus's birth could also be described as literally just an astronomical event. So whether he existed, who he was, what his role was here on earth, there are many questions. But I think it's important. One thing I learned being raised as a Christian and then stepping outside of that circle and having a respect for all religions is they all teach pretty much the same principles about how to behave as a human being. Do um, no harm. You, you have all the things that make sense. sense. Right. You know, so, um, but there is a higher learning injected um, into the basis of all these religions. And again, if you re go back to the, not the King's James English version, roll it back to the 
Hebrew, Old Testament, roll it back to the Akkadian, Sumerian. You know, you find these versions of, just like in English, we have the seven days of creation. Well, in Sumerian, there are seven tablets of creation, part of a much longer story. And many of these uh, descriptions in the Atrahasis, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, they, they give us a lot more detail about the creation story and include other characters, some of them being, for instance, like this planet Nibiru and how, excuse me, and how it possibly shaped our solar system in its very earliest form. And so a lot of that information, again, when you look at it from end to end, explaining some of the even parts of how our Earth came to be, it gets into an interesting story. I'll touch into one of those since I, you know, I mentioned Nibiru and creation tales. Sure. Right now, if you look at our Earth's history going back 4.7 billion years, rolling back the clock, when everything was just coalescing, it became one giant supercontinent called Pangaea. So it's basically one landmass all connected and then everything else is water. Now, over time, again, lots of time, the land masses have moved apart like a skin of an apple just kind of popping off. And you can see that today, if you were to move all the pieces back together, like, oh, wow, Pangaea, it fits. What's interesting is that rolling back the clock in the story of creation from the Sumerian point of view, Nibiru, its main moon, comes in and whacks our primitive earth and literally hits it in so, such a forceful manner, it strews out a, a debris field, which the, the Bible literally calls the hammered out bracelet, the asteroid belt. And so when we look at that story and see that, you know, Earth being whacked by another moon and making it just one chunk landmass and all the water kind of coalesces around it, it literally fits the creation story of Pangaea visualizing, you can see that it's just one landmass, the water all fits around it, and it kind of moves into shape. So from the, from the very beginning of the tale, there's, there's linkage there with our own knowledge and science that holds up from some of these creation myths, especially the Sumerian ones, where we're not trying to change the Bible in any way. We're basically upholding the biblical veracity by showing just how deep these connections go. Right, and that's a, I, that's cool that you mentioned like a planet hitting Earth or a moon hitting Earth because now they actually do like take take a, like biblical history away. They call it what they call it uh, Thea, which was a planet pretty much that hit Earth and it caused the scar of the Pacific Ocean. Like they know they can, and that's like. But then they say uh, you're saying asteroid belt, but they say that's ended up being our moon. But maybe it could have been a combination of both. Like some some chunks formed our moon that it's in such close Earth like orbit to earth that doesn't seem possible a lot of people think and then maybe the fragments spun off and did form an asteroid belt so that's pretty cool yeah and there's been a lot of theories recently right over the last 10 years to explain mm -hmm. oh wow yeah something came in and whacked earth the debris field coalesced to make our moon something of that nature it starts to get a little bit more in alignment with the uh, with the sumerian versions now, besides like uh, geological and astronomical processes that are, you know, perhaps outlined in the Bible, I mean, you have things like, you know, the, some of the more well-known relics and, you know, perhaps like ancient technologies that could have been left behind or mm -hmm. somewhere. I mean, you have things like, you know, perhaps the existence of things like the Ark of the Covenant or Philosopher's Stone or like some kind of, uh, you know, an Excalibur is something that uh, are perhaps – uh, ancient technology. So in your experience, um, in, you know, in your studies, uh, what do you think is probably, I don't know, maybe your top or your top, I can say top three, if you can't think of just one, um, uh, like possibilities of like, uh, of one of these is like an actual, we could find and interact with like, uh, well, I, I got a, I definitely got a doozy for, of an answer for you there, but I want to give you a two part question. So <clears throat> remind me of Ark of the Covenant. If, if I literally, spin off on a tangent on this first one and forget. Okay, so two parts. One, and when you mentioned geological and astronomical data, I just want to touch on the fact that for even non-scientific people, you don't have a degree, you would like to find evidence in this field and, and show, I've, like, I found some type of connection. Anyone can do this research using two tools. 
One, geological evidence. And then two is astronomical evidence. So if we look at Egypt as an example, geologically, there's a discrepancy by, between the date they're given to say that the pyramids were built by the Egyptians since 2500 BC. Geologically, we can look at the surrounding terrain of the Sphinx, the inner enclosure of the walls, and see that it's massive water weathering has taken place. That means that like, water must have been flowing heavily over the surface for a long period of time. They can't explain that other than to say that, well, the last time there was water like this on Egypt would have been like pre-deluge, you know, 10,000 years plus. So there's great geological evidence, one, of water erosion to say, wow, these structures might be much older. Two, if you just look on Google Earth and, and, and realize that the pyramids and the Nile used to be right next to each other, right? The Pharaoh would walk down, get on his boat, cruise the Nile. I'm awesome. Now, <laughs> it, it, now if you look on Google Earth, you'll see that the Nile has meandered many miles away from the pyramids. That's a geological change that, again, you can track in differentiation. Two is astronomically. The pyramids are aligned to the Orion constellation. The Orion, they're literally a terrestrial map of the Orion constellation. But from the year 10,500 B.C., you can use Redshift or any other star charting software, and it'll tell you what stars are going to be above you tonight, tomorrow night, or 10,000 years ago. And it turns out that Egypt was built where Orion at 10,500 BC is reflected by the three pyramids, three in a line, one slightly offset. And, and the Sphinx is directly staring east into the constellation of Leo. So... Astronomical evidence is pretty strong there for a 10,500 date. Hmm. Geological evidence shows much more of a 10,000 you know, to 13,000 range. Other areas like Cusco and Peru, you can see that uh, Lake Titicaca has receded and sites like Machu Picchu and others were right on the edge of a shoreline that doesn't exist much like it, it did now, right? So... I would say that, one, you can look at a lot of the geological and astronomical evidence for some of these sites, find alignments to dates, and look at the evidence that way to compile a much more interesting case. Two, sorry for the long-winded answer. No, it's great. Perfect. Yeah, awesome. yeah, well, here's your juicy answer. One of the most esoteric things that I've seen is the topic of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the exodus of Moses is intertwined with another character, uh, whose name is Akhenaten, and he was one of the uh, first the pharaohs. alien hybrid pharaoh. The alien king, yeah. yeah. That's right. Now, there, there's strong evidence to show that what he was also using as what we know as the Ark of the Covenant was essentially some type of a power source for the Great Pyramid. The Ark of the Covenant fits at a, at a biblical cubit length, literally right into the box that's sitting there today that they're like, oh, this is the leftover chamber for a tomb. It's not. It actually is lined with crystallized, you know, perfectly sealed in a way to generate an electrical charge and keep it resonating. So my theory, which I'm still looking into and others, is that the Ark of the Covenant was being used to power the Great Pyramid at a, at a large scale. And what happened was when Akhenaten left with his people, he also took the Ark of the Covenant and of course, if you take the battery out of the city and the lights turn out, yeah, mm. Ramses comes after him, not just for his people, but to get the Ark of the Covenant back. So there's a much more interesting and intricate tale there about the Exodus being tied to the Ark of the Covenant, not just holding some tablets, but being a, a large ancient power source. Some type of capacitor for the Great Pyramid to project some type of low current when, energy. Like when you, when yes. you read... Like exactly. you, there are tons of references of the ark itself killing people, shooting lightning bolts. Mm -hmm. Like anybody who's tried to, you know, like that's fucking crazy. That adds up. If you've seen Somebody, Indiana Jones, battery or something. You know, that yeah. melting faces scared the hell out of me. And yeah. there is, you know, significant evidence to suggest that the ark of the covenant is a real object. We did an, uh, I did an on camera experiment for ancient aliens here at the U university of Irv Irvine with the, uh, the lab physics professor, Dr. Denon Clark, he's a good friend of mine, and we created a life-size Ark of the Covenant and ran current through it and showed that it's basically a grounded capacitor. 
So meaning the people that had to carry the ark wore a special set of stones. It can only touch it in certain places. Um, there was a very like defined process for how you interacted with this object. Um, and it made it sound exactly like it was some type of high energy capacitor. Wow. Well, you, cause cool. you t- well I was just going to say, cause they, they talk about, cause a lot of like the, a lot of the internet always says like, Oh, Tesla based his, you know, his tower upon the construction of the pyramid of Giza. Cause it's built over an aquifer and some type of that moving water over the type of stone created some type of vibrational energy, which could be projected through the top capstone and then maybe picked up by the obelisks. Cause no one really knows the purpose of these giant hundred plus 200 plus ton obelisks seeming seemingly all over Egypt, some type of ionosphere energy transmission and then they do have some, some hieroglyphs even show like some type of like battery, or like batteries or light bulbs. Well, so yeah, they, the they, almost like, light bulb. Like they, they almost knew like of the process of electricity that could create light. Well, you so, have the Baghdad battery and the Dendera light bulb. And Baghdad right? ba- battery has been proven that it can hold like one, ba- one Baghdad battery is like a double A battery. It's crazy. So like it, wow. it can, it can power a light bulb. Like it's crazy. Two, two topics. You guys are giving me light. Great segue. I feel bad too. Um, and maybe I could do this since you said you're going to edit this. I have a maybe. Baghdad battery upstairs, and I was going to bring it and show it to you on camera. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got we, it. Yeah. yeah. Just go get it. it. Whoa. 100%. We'll, we'll make that happen in a minute, but I wanted to give okay. you two answers, and we can come back to that. Um, when we talk about you know more of the evidence at a granular level and not just the Ark of the Covenant, right, there's micro as well as macro evidence of ancient technology. And in Dendera, Egypt, there are wall reliefs of what clearly are depicted as light bulbs plugged into some type of energy source. Now, Mm -hmm. modern Egyptologists tell you that what you're seeing there is the lotus flower. And what you're seeing coming out there is simply the aroma of the lotus flower. It looks like a filament. It does. Now, I did an on-camera test where I had one of those created using the same type of like light methane gas that could come out naturally from a swamp. And just giving it a slight electrical charge, it illuminates. Wow. Um, and I do have a Baghdad battery, and I'm able to use grape juice, wine, vinegar, orange juice. And with that, I can create a consistency of four volts registered with a vo- voltmeter. So if you figure, you know, a, a modern flashlight can be powered by a nine volt battery, they definitely had the capacity to use electricity. And if you look at a lot of these, like deep recess of, recesses of crypts, you know, in underground dwellings, there's no evidence of soot where all these hieroglyphs and colors are carved. No flame, no evidence of flame being lit there for hours and burning the wall. The only other thing they say is they were using copper mirrors to reflect the light. It just... No. These light! <laughs> I, I thought they, just the answer is simple. They were using mirrors. electricity. Yeah, it's very simple, you know. Now, I will, I will touch on, too, when you talk about a subtle energy where I theorize, and this might, you know, go into the last part of our conversation with, with more depth here, but one of the theories I've been studying is called the lost cycle of time. And many ancient cultures tracked what we now call precession, which is a 24,000-year cycle, 12,000 years of going into a golden age, 12,000 years of descension into a dark age, and it repeats. Somehow, when we were in the golden ages, as we're starting to creep back into the dark ages, they built, in theory, still don't know, some type of geodetically placed connected set of sites that when flipped on, take that natural energy that happens during the golden age and keep it alive as long as you can. Now, we've tied it to a process that might be related to our sun. Uh, One of the best theories now is that we're most likely not a single sun solar system. I know. It's very likely that we have two suns. All the other solar systems that we've been filming most likely are binary, most of them even sometimes more than two suns. And so the whole model of our solar system's motion if you think about it, it changes if we're a binary system. And I'll, I'll spell it out. Meaning, if you think about a solar system model right now, you see the sun and our little planet spinning around our sun. If our sun is in orbit around another sun, 
That means that all of us, all of our other planets, we're going along for a ride mm. through space, three-dimensionally, moving through space while the sun is orbiting another sun. So from that perspective, there's a good chance to reason that when our suns are at their farthest points in their orbit, we're in the dark ages. When our wow. suns are at their closest point in the orbits, we're in the golden age. Something happens about sunlight. Now, if you think about summertime, and I'm going to go deep in with a couple of examples, you guys are going to be like, wow, what the hell? But summertime, you know, plants wake up, everyone gets energy, and you want to go outside, and you feel alive, and it's just awesome. Something about the energy of two suns, maybe a bluish tint rather than yellow, does something at an evolutionary process where we just enhance and I, I don't understand what it is, but that's the part I'm trying to unlock. And there's just a great amount of evidence to show that we're going through this cycle and we're just now coming out of the dark ages again and unlocking this lost knowledge. Um, and I'll give you the last piece before I'll shut up. The ancients knew about three cycles. The first two we get, but the third one we're like, uh, wow. Cycle number one is we're spinning on our axis, on our axis, Right. And because of that change, every 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night, you don't realize it, but when it gets dark out, like it's about to happen in about an hour, your subconscious says, oh, time to go to sleep, and you, you, you're you out. And that is because of a solar motion. The planet spinning, you go to sleep during that second phase. Cycle number two, the planet is orbiting around the sun. And because of that, we can see physical changes that take place on the planet. Temperature variations, planets, uh, plants and animals moving around, migrating, um, you know, temperature differences, all because of the orbit. Now they say there's a third effect, which is precession. And it's basically this 24,000 year cycle, which causes a rise and fall of civilization. We don't quite understand it because it's 24,000 years Right. And we only live a hundred years, right? It's, it's much harder for us to understand uh, the frame of reference, but there's a much bigger picture there and uh, an unlocking how procession was viewed as the 12 constellations we have now. It's like a grand celestial clock. And every 2000 years, we point to a new North star. We just moved out of the age of Pisces. So right Aquarius. around 2012 into the age of Aquarius. The Mayan calendar wasn't over. It's resetting into a new age. I can start blasting that song again. Yeah, I was going to say, it's <laughs> a way better Aquarius. song for this. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, for it. Well, it, and it, that's kind of an interesting thought, too, because I'm, I'm still under the impression that we don't truly know why we sleep. Like, we're just like, we're like, we, we have some pretty good ideas. Like, well, you know, conserve some energy through the night. But like, we don't actually like recovery. Yeah. Recovery. Know. That's the main. We yeah. We but that, but know. other than that, it's like you can d yeah. get that. It's from, very essential. To yeah. But you can get that keep from you from going crazy. Like yeah. <laughs> also, like. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, I have very vivid dreams, and so I even wonder sometimes if our consciousness doesn't play another role when we're not sleeping. If it's like being occupied by some other part of our presence that we just don't understand. So who yeah. knows. Uh, that's a really good point because yeah I'm, I'm thinking about that and it's like um uh, some of the some of the some of the studies are kind of put forth a theory that it's perhaps like one one of the ideas is when we sleep that's the time for our brains to kind of organize a lot of the information that we've accumulated over the over the day over the source of the day our, our brains need time i mean it's like like a computer you, you gather a bunch of data but it needs time to process it and you know why like how does it process this information and what does it prioritize and what does it deprioritize and what goes into what i mean that's still pretty much a mystery about where some of that stuff goes so like you said it's like uh, is is it are we drawing it in, in, into something is it being forgotten or is it being you know broadcasted somewhere is it being stored somewhere off site in a cloud like a, you know, <laughs> it's something like that perhaps it's funny you say cloud because my question is going to say that I hope maybe within our lifetime technology, I don't think it's going to solve it, but maybe technology will allow us a bridge into paranormal or into the afterlife. If we think about it as a vibrational frequency at third dimensional vibration and how we work, maybe there's something there that they're able to tune in to other channels. You know, 
if you think about a radio station, if you're at one station and it's playing rock and roll and you to some classical, there's kind of this phasing out from one signal until the sh the other one comes in. And it's almost like sometimes paranormal experiences are like that. It's like the creature, the object or whatever isn't quite phased, tuned all the, all the way in. And there's these interactions where we can't quite understand. But if we're able to perhaps tune that to a frequency or somehow create a technology layer that allows us to understand it better, paranormal investigating will become a lot more interesting. Man, uh, I'm glad I'm glad you said that because we because we operate and we perceive the universe through visible light as humans. We have instruments you can see in the infrared and ultraviolet, etc. But visible light is only like a fraction of a percent of yeah. what's actually out there, what's actually being emanated from through the galaxy. So if we could, yeah, if we could develop tech, as you said, to be able to, maybe that's all it is. It's like these people are operating on different frequencies, these extraterrestrials, these other civilizations or whatever it is. If we just can develop the tech to see, because we can see infrared and ultraviolet, but we can't see everything all the time. If we can just hone that technology, there's some type of light being or, something that can manifest from a different frequency into our own. I mean, that's, just, that's, that's an endless, endless thought that I have all the time. Like, well, we're, we, we're, just, we're here. We operate here. I mean, what about the 99.9% .9 other frequencies? Or yeah. even making the tech like just more practical. Like we, 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 have, we have detectors that can pretty much detect gravity. Like uh, that was a couple of years ago when they used the, like, the laser, the laser, measurement i can't remember the, the whole black holes collided yeah, right when the black holes collided it. and you, you we literally detected gravity waves like for the one of the first times ever and it's like you know we have some of the technology that you know that paranormal researchers use you have your your emfs and your, your uh, you know radio frequency scanners to to some extent and having those things it's like just maybe that stuff that they're using is just not sensitive enough like it's mm. not it, it, the the stuff that you know the big universities and you know private private research uh foundations use like th those things take up like entire mm. floors of you know of buildings and it's like if at some time we can make that technology you know they shrink it down whether it's you know uh, a modification of you know the processors or whatever they can do if they can shrink those processes into something that is uh portable and you know uh, accessible to to everybody um and like you said like it just maybe it's just a matter of time till we're able to apply those and take those out and move them out and we will find something that we've just been we just haven't had the right tools to detect what is going on and follow those lines of inquiry into the esoteric and the paranormal yeah there's two things out there there's one if you google kodak ghost film there was in the 80s a certain type of Kodak film that picked up paranormal stuff easier. And this one guy literally was having conversations where the ghost would write in the special frequency that could be seen on the film. And they were having full on conversations for like over a year. Weird stuff, but this certain Kodak photography film, there might be things like that where we're just not using the right tools, but also just. From a, from a more like down to earth perspective, you know, using terms like chat GPT and AI, mm -hmm. it's, it's very possible that within the next few years, I know I'm working on it as a side project, is creating machine learning around our specific areas of knowledge and applying them in ways where at a high level, there's still gaps in the overall knowledge base. I'll give you an example. If you go to chat GPT for now and ask it, what's ancient aliens or what's the ancient astronaut theory, it's going to be like, oh, it's this pseudoscience thing that some people are looking into and blah, 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 blah. Right. It hasn't been learned or taught from data sets of saying like, go watch 19 seasons of ancient aliens and then let me ask you a question. It hasn't been trained on that data. So one, there's going to be a whole bunch of new information that we need to feed to our overall learning of these mechanisms as people are tripping out on them. They're missing a lot of the nuances of like real knowledge, but two, you know, we can use these tools now to do some very creative stuff. When we talk about machine learning, 
let's say you create a data set of all the known UFO types, cylindrical, spherical, triangular, whatever, and you load it into a machine learning and say, okay, I want you to scrub through like all known live stream webcam archives uh, and look for any of these types of objects and flag if you find any of them. I'll give you an example. Like I use a service here in San Diego called Surfline. It allows me to look at all the beaches that I want to go surfing at and it live streams it 24 hours a day and, re and keeps in the archives three days back. I could take all that footage and scrub it to say, look for anything in any of these files over the last three days of 24 hours across these six beaches facing from San Diego westward. Do you, do you see anything? Model two, look for any of these types of things and scrub NASA's archive of the surface of Mars for pyramids, faces, whatever mm -hmm. else that I'd want to, to teach it to go look for instead of like I had to do manually for the last 20 years of looking it's cross each image, through, yeah. the, the machine learning and AI could be like, blah, blah, blah. oh yeah, look, I found these 17 hits, right? So there's a much more utilitarian explosion of tools that I think are coming, especially around ufology, um, that, that'll just speed up the process of we want, what we would want to do and kind of get more people involved to you know create a large data set. So that's exciting. Yeah, no doubt. That's super cool. Uh, yeah, making any types of, I mean... I, some of the biggest things are when technology that is, you know, this is AI has kind of been a little bit of the realm of, uh, you know, sci-fi, of course, like for the last, you know, decades uh, until now. I mean, you had like Deep Blue and you're like, okay, you can beat a couple of chess guys. Like, I mean, not a couple of Gary Katz, probably, you know, whatever. Grandmaster chess masters, but whatever, who cares? Like, what is that going to do for me? I never play chess. But you have something like this, like AI, which is like now becoming like a home tool and it's becoming accessible to people where it's like yeah chat gpt does a ton of really neat things that um but a lot of like those neat things you just have to know how to ask the right questions and once you get those questions down and like you can get it to do things like hey i need you to explain this concept to me as if i were an eighth grader and it's can take like quantum physics or something like that or string theory and kind of break it down into like these little easier more digestible pieces and all of that knowledge becomes more accessible <laughs> which is like you could say the same thing about the gutenberg press or like when you know we learned how to make paper and you know record knowledge and people learned how to read and that's when these explosions of knowledge happen and this just might be we're on the precipice of that now which is yeah, it's exciting. all fun and games until it becomes <laughs> skynet all right yeah, yeah everyone, everyone always alludes to it having an you know an intelligence and i'm looking at it from more just the utilitarian aspect not so much like an ethical what's going to happen when we give it life um but there's still interesting crossovers there i saw an article recently where uh, i believe it was in brazil a drone was flying over a part of the amazon where they no one goes and they filmed a tribe that's literally cut off from civilization it doesn't interact in any way with civilization completely kept to itself and you know it's seeing this drone filming them for the first time um, and you wonder like what kind of an influence that's going to have on on them now we're interested in going wow what are they doing but from their perspective you know how is that going to change their you know view of technology or of a flying machine and it's the same thing that has played out across the globe from other cultures um and you know you know it's something that you can it's got a name it's called cargo cult um but it plays into the ancient astronaut theory to define how this has happened from ancient cultures in world war one and, and in world war two and in more modern times you know when we flew airplanes into these parts and and, and, a, and a soldier gets out for the first time and interacts with the tribesmen you know he lights up a cigarette and, and they're like wow what is he doing holds out a voice recorder and records their voice and plays it back takes photographs of them they don't understand any of this technology sometimes uh, shipments would be dropped from a plane and it would land in the middle of the tribe and instead of the camp the tribes people crack it open and it's like you know guns <laughs> And food, they're like, oh, you know, what is this awesomeness coming from the sky? They didn't understand the soldiers or the planes they flew in. And so when the soldiers packed up and left, 
an interesting phenomenon happen. You see them scraping away runways, making models of the airplane that look just like an airplane, and they would sit there for hours staring at the sky, hoping to entice these things to come back and land, right? They didn't understand the technology, but they clearly had interact with something that it affected them. And if you look back in history, you can see all these ancient cultures that said they came down from the skies. Now, we don't understand the technology, so we maybe put them in a chariot or give it some natural understanding. But there's all these descriptions of them receiving information or interacting with these people who had the, the power of flight um, without not possibly understanding how that technology worked. They see, they see something and they document it. In their That's own correct. version, depending on the well, culture. And I always think of that as like just an like extrapolation on how things could be. Like we think we're the top end. We're like, oh, people are like, oh, this is it. Us humans, we're it. I go, well, like the evidence for me that there is extraterrestrial life that would come and visit, not say anything, do a flyby, peek in, leave. Like we do that to p other humans. They have no idea. We could make <laughs> their lives exponentially better in an hour. And we're like, no, no, no. Do not contact them. It's their way of life, right? And we and we do that to other humans. So it's like to, to say that now, like we're the top of the food chain. I'm like, are we? Are we 100% sure on that? Or could there even be more advanced humans that just look at our planet and go like, hey, they're doing their thing. Leave them, leave them be. <laughs> they roll up their windows as they drive by. Yeah, it's just whatever. like just extrapolate that, right? No, you're right. I mean, whatever higher intelligence is interacting with our planet – they've shown a great deal of restraint in how they've interacted with us. All the evidence of them, and I say them broadly, of UFO activity, going over military silos, nuclear silos, independently turning missile silos off, doing crazy things in our airspace, there's no answer for that. And if they wanted to do something to harm us, there's nothing stopping them, but they've been very like just kind of pushing us slightly to make decisions on our own in, in, in a better way and hopefully join this galactic community that's going on. But there's clearly, you know, something happening where over the last 50 years, the way this information is being presented to us is spoon fed in a very systematic way that again, is obfuscated from the true information. And I'll, and I'll show just a few words, you know, um, Project Blue Book, Project Grudge, uh, the Condon Report, ATIP, no offense to any of my friends on that thing, but all of these task force have done nothing to reveal new knowledge to the public, while in the background, there's clear evidence to show that for a long time, they've been reverse engineering and doing stuff that they have the knowledge, and it's not even perhaps the military or the government, it's private corporations that somehow have their hand in this mix, which I can't explain either. Um, but it is an interesting well, look at I mean, to where got, we are today. Goddamn it's Blink very 182 hard to has their hands on stuff allegedly, right? So it's like, <laughs> oh, well, he's got it all. Got, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, well, how, like yeah. You know, I was just saying the, the game has changed. The game has changed. That's all. You know, when we first started looking into these topics 20 years ago, only the military were funding and researching projects that had to do with alien tech. Whereas today in 2023, I, with my own technical skills, can go work for companies that are reverse engineering technology and get clearances and work on these as right. like my day job. That's a game changer as to why that's happening other than it's just a systematic release and closer tightening in of this, you know, as part of our society. It's just not going to happen overnight. It's like happening gradually. So what are your thoughts on the recent, you know, we've had the last year pretty exciting in the, in the UFO world with the military come out with the Tic Tac and the gimbal and now the, you know, the Baghdad uh, UFO, the Baghdad Phantom. Uh, the congressional hearings. What are your thoughts on these releases? Where do you think that's going? Right. So just everything with even like ATIP and now taking UFO and making it UAP, it's just more obfuscation and confusion to not really hone in on what's really going on. Um, I think, again, it's an interesting 
change? Um, I'd answer it this way. The last time technology from the U.S. military was brought forth was stealth technology of the F-117 and the B-2. And then, and so these things that we've been hearing about in the background, I think they've been trying to find a way to bring it to the public surface. And so the, the tidbits we see now of some of these foreign adversarial swarm drone, anti-gravitic, supersonic, a bunch of stuff, not alien, clearly next level tech is being shown because there's another egg to crack, in my opinion, which is the roughly $12 trillion in missing black budget funds that have gone, gone towards a secret naval fleet of spaceships, an extension of the Navy into space. And, you know, I, I'm sure there's a reason why it's not general public knowledge, but I firmly believe that a secret space program exists and that slowly that topic will be breached, especially if we go to Mars and things like that. Gary McKinnon hacking into NASA, mm, others right. who have broken this topic. It's not me. I'm just regurgitating known facts that clearly show, you know, there's there's you know a, a, a military presence in space, which most likely is a, a, an extension of the Navy. That's insane because we've we've talked about that before secret space program i mean you, I, you probably can't take everyone's word for it but the fact that if we do have this tech it makes sense that we i mean for 20 or 30 years we didn't know about the blackbird right some super advanced spy craft or sp spy plane that we had no idea of so in 20 years from now we look back and like oh yeah we did have some type of at least interplanetary space force that we didn't tell the public about they haven't it's not, it doesn't, doesn't seem like a stretch. They haven't released anything since stealth generation tech. There is something coming, which will be trans-atmospheric vehicles that go into space. Um, and also, just from a standpoint of looking from a higher viewpoint, we put a man on the moon in 1969 and stopped. That's like, that's like Intel building the Pentium and saying, we built the <laughs> Pentium chip. It's got 100 megahertz. We've done it. We're going to stop. We're done. The pinnacle. You know, now it's like, you know, the Pentium 4.4 gigahertz quad process. I mean, the point is they never stopped going to the moon and, and, and to Mars. You know, they never stopped. It's just not public knowledge. At some point, they're going to have to merge it back into some type of public awareness if we are a spacefaring race and we start to go to the moon and the Mars through SpaceX and other companies. Yeah, it's, it's a cool time. Well, cool it does time. feel like we're we're really quickly ramping up here to another space race, you know, especially with China announcing their, you know, their plans to go back to the moon. Artemis so mission, may, and maybe that's what we're we're about to see. Is this? And I'm all for it. Bring it on. Let's see it. Let's get another race going. Like I, I would love to to see that and uh, push the boundaries of what we know. Yeah, and the only thing that I fear. Last few minutes here is that, you know, a lot of these topics that come around ufology for what ifs, we have seen certain scenarios play out in the past that are trying to steer towards, let's call it like a one world government. Mm -hmm. And not to say I support that in any way, but there have been events in the past that question if something gnarly next were to happen. At a global level, I would say that if you see all of a sudden when you wake up one day, UFOs all over the news, or that there's some type of invasion being announced, or you can see them in the skies, I would give caution to say that this is also probably planned and not just a spontaneous event. The next big shakedown thing would be the threat of an alien invasion. They've already used the threat of terrorists and other things like that. Um, well, it other, does seem like they're kind of war, prepping that because the, with the mothership. Cut you off would be aliens. Yeah, sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Oh, they said uh, you know they just recently they were in the in the UFO briefing talking about a mothership potentially could be in our solar system. I was like, well, that's a weird thing to announce. just kind of let that slip in there. Yeah. <laughs> who knows? You know, I mean, who knows? I I, I wouldn't say it's not possible, but um, if if something like that was announced, I would give great caution to say that. It's probably a staged event of some of kind, 
leading up towards this, you know, di disclosure type gradual release of this information. Now, Jason, just before we let you go, uh, we're, we're approaching uh, the end of the time limit here. Where you're, you're speaking at Contact in the Desert June 2nd to 4th, but other than that, where can people go to find more of your work? Uh, well, you know, the best place is just to stay up to date is on jasonmartell.com. I will be appearing on April 10th in an episode of History's Greatest Mysteries, talking cool. about uh, pyramid power with Chris Dunn. Um, so it's good that we touched on that. That was timely. And I'm also working on season four for The Proof is Out There, another series on the History Channel. So that's exciting. Um, and maybe I'll be doing some more Ancient Aliens work. Uh, but uh, definitely best place to catch me is just staying up to date with my website. I try to post relevant information there. And love all the new conferences that are happening once again post-COVID. Um, always looking for opportunities to meet people in person and collaborate further. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Awesome. Hey, Jason, you guys have really... two seconds. If you guys have two seconds, as I promised, I'll flip on the light. Go we'll grab that oh, yeah. battery. Oh. Let's get oh, the Baghdad yeah. battery. Yeah, yeah we'll, 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 we'll hold here. <clears throat> That's cool. Awesome. He has a fucking real Baghdad battery. That's badass. <laughs> So I, I like picked it, picked it up in like Iraq and like like a, like a Seven Eleven. <laughs> like they just got them all over the place. Well, you got it like a pickle baby. Like a pickle yeah, baby. Yeah, buddy, yeah, you exactly. want bag that battery? Number one, good price, huh? You charge phone. You got grape juice. You got Pepsi. What do you want? Put it in, huh? Yeah, just you yell at Saeed. Like he that. brings one out. Of, like, I just out of the back. USB C cable. USB C cable. Nah, no, just use bag that battery. Yeah, yeah that's that's so <laughs> going right on rock. <laughs> I've seen I've seen him before on like, on the internet and pictures, but I've never actually seen one. I saw I think I saw I I remember seeing the Ancient Aliens episode. And there's probably a couple other ones where they brought it All out. Right. They always got the areas. Let's see it. This one's been wrapped up. So let me make sure it's here. Someone stole it and put a fake in there. That's what. <laughs> No, I got all the pieces here. Let me just give you the little show and tell real quick. Pretty easy. All right, so basically what this is. Here it is. Baghdad battery. Oh, so this is dope. a small clay pot. And then I have an iron rod wrapped around a copper lining with an asphalt stopper. Right? Yep. Fill this with grape juice, wine, or vinegar. Place it into the inner part like this. Just get it to kind of fit all the way down in there. And um, eventually I can just use a, a voltmeter attached to these two surfaces and it'll create positive electrons from grape juice, wine, vinegar, and you can generate about four volts. That's crazy. That's so is there, that's so wild. Is there different, did they find different like sizes of those that could create say eight or 12 or like um, Mul multiples of the volts or is it just you can yes. just put them in series those, those small there's, ones. there's there's all over egypt there's these large vase type structures um that some of them are six feet um oh shit and, and so you imagine that you know you could get a, a charge uh, to do something much larger something small also like that could be used next to a statue so that when you went up to a church or something and you touched the statue, it would give you a static electricity shock. It would bzz, you'd be like, the power of the gods, you know. Right, right, so right, 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 right. They used it for creative purposes, but uh, I think clearly one of the other ones was as electricity, the power source. Yeah, like a, yeah, a low, a low volt light or something to be able to see in those passages of the pyramids and other. I think so. Yeah. Well, it's like how we use, you know, robots and animatronics, I would think. Like, you know, we could use them to build, like, robots that do work, but we have, you know, animated replicas of presidents in Disney World. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, hey, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time, coming on the show. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Uh, to be honest, uh, we, we've talked about it before on the show. You were one of our favorite people to meet in person uh, at you. Healing Con. So, uh, I appreciate that. You know, definitely a, an approachable guy. Um, again, thanks for coming on the show. And as we always say at the end of these things, keep those eyes on the skies. Excellent.
hours? hours. Um, that's fucking. It's wild to think with the batteries, and you know, it's it's weird. We this I think this kind of happened to us last year. Is as we talked to all these people, you kind of like make connection to other theories and other readings. I'm starting to think that when we talk, like when we're talking to these people, I'm getting more and more on board with the fact that when we think about these Ark of the Covenants and these things, that they were 